I'm Mark Schnitzer from the Stanford University Department of Applied Physics in the Department of Biology and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'm going to be describing today uh, some microscopy techniques that our lab has developed for imaging cells and their attributes deep within the tissues of, of live animal subjects and also in animal subjects that are free to behave about the laboratory. My lab focuses on issues pertaining to neuroscience, particularly at the circuit level. Now, I think we would all tend to agree that brain circuits remain d deeply mysterious. Nonetheless, some of the brain's most fascinating properties arise uh, from it, the circuit attributes. The numbers involved in trying to dissect neural circuit function are daunting indeed. In the human brain, there are approximately 100 billion neurons and over 100 trillion synapses. So these numbers pose some severe challenges. Nonetheless, we have to develop approaches towards understanding how do we learn, and as I'll talk a little bit about in this lecture, how do we control our body movements. One of the things that has been badly missing in neuroscience is information about uh, what I'll call the brain's cellular orchestra. We would like to know what are the large-scale uh, dynamic patterns of activity across uh, large populations of individual cells and how these dynamic patterns influence animal behavior. Towards obtaining such information, we need to have imaging techniques or microscopy techniques that are capable of inspecting cells and watching their dynamics in awake behaving animals. However, traditionally, a challenge has been that the classical con or conventional light microscope has not been well suited to studies in awake behaving animals. So therefore, traditionally at least, if you wanted to be able to inspect cells in the live mammalian brain, uh, you might do this in an anesthetized uh, animal subject. And this is a, a far side cartoon which provides the, the physicist's view of this. The caption reads, what about that? His brain still uses the old vacuum tubes. But ideally, we'd like to be able to inspect cells not just in anesthetized subjects, but in animal subjects that are free to move about the laboratory and do interesting things. And to look at cells not just in the superficial brain areas, where the conventional light microscope can do, can do well, but also in, in deeper brain areas that lie beyond the penetration depth of the conventional microscopy techniques. So the two main challenges here are the ability to inspect cells that lie deep in tissue and the ability to observe cells and their dynamics, not just in live subjects, but in animal subjects that are free to move about the laboratory. And I will discuss these two technical dilemmas in turn. The first technical challenge here is how do we perform cellular level imaging with my micron scale resolution in deep tissues and in vivo. And when I say in vivo here, I mean generally in the live mammalian brain. And this slide illustrates some of the optical challenges involved. Light scattering is actually the chief impediment, not light absorption. These outer colored bands indicate the range of tissue that is accessible to conventional light microscopy techniques. So for example, if you wish to inspect cells with a conventional confocal fluorescence microscope, you can observe cells in approximately the outer 50 to 100 microns of tissue, as illustrated here in, with this orange band in this sagittal view of the rat brain. The two photon fluorescence microscope can do much better, as indicated here by this uh, green band. The two photon microscope can penetrate about 500 to 700 microns, maybe a little bit more on a very good day, deep into brain tissue. But I think you can see that the vast majority of the mammalian brain actually lies out of reach of these uh, conventional microscopy techniques. And so the question thus is, how do we inspect cells in deeper lying areas uh, that pertain to many brain diseases? How do we look at cells in deep areas such as the hippocampus, the basal ganglia, and many other areas of interest? Well, over the last few years, my group has developed techniques that we call uh, microendoscopy. And the microendoscopy methods make use of fluorescence contrast modalities, as well as some other contrast modalities, such as second harmonic generation. And I'll discuss these as we uh, proceed. This slide here illustrates some of the micro-optical probes that our lab has explored for imaging cells that lie deep in the brain. This probe here is 1,000 microns in diameter. This one is 350 microns in diameter, and it's poised to go into Abraham Lincoln's brain. At the tip of each probe, you can see a tiny little micro-optical objective that provides the micron scale resolution that we need to see cells in deep lying locations. And in each case, this micro-optical objective is followed by a longer but weaker relay lens whose main purpose is to give us the reach we need to penetrate deep into tissue. Before I go into the details about how these micro-optical probes work, I'm going to show you an, ex an example set of videos that illustrate what you can observe in the living brain looking through these optical needles, these micro-optical probes. In the first video, you're going to see a low magnification view 
of microcirculation in the vascular network in a deep brain area in hippocampal CA1 in a live rodent. We've performed an intravascular injection of a fluorescent dye fluorescein. The dye will label the blood plasma brightly, whereas the red blood cells will appear dark in relief. And you're going to be able to see them flowing through the individual capillaries. In the first video, we've inserted a low magnification optical needle into the tissue. But already at this low magnification, you can already make out the structure of the microvasculature, the directions of flow, relative speeds, and so forth. We can now hot swap the optical probes, pulling this low magnification probe out of the brain and replacing it with a probe of higher magnification. Here in this slide, now you can see the individual red blood cells passing single file through the capillaries in this live brain. We can now replace the microoptical probe again, inserting a higher magnification optical needle. And now here at this very highest magnification, you can clearly see the individual red blood cells passing through the capillary. And if I stop the video to give you a closer look at one of these erythrocytes, you can see that the individual cells, which we know to be about 8 microns in extent, actually appear to be broader than the diameter of the capillary itself. And that gives you a sense of the kind of micron scale details that we can see uh, in real time looking through one of these micro-optical needles. Building on these basic capabilities for micro-optical imaging, we have extended our imaging capacities in several different directions. First, we've come up with a chronic mouse preparation that allows us to perform time-lapse or longitudinal imaging at the cellular scale, uh, returning again and again to the same site in the brain, the same cells, the same neuronal dendrites, and in some cases even the same synapses. In most mice, we're able to do this for a period of about two months. Occasionally, we've been able to follow cells in an individual mouse for periods of up to a year. Secondly, we have been able to combine the micro-optical lenses that I've been discussing with other small elements, such as microfabricated laser scanning mirrors that have allowed us to put together a small mouse-sized uh, two-photon microscope with a mass of approximately 2.5 grams. And complementary to this small device, is another instrument, a high-speed 1.1 gram epifluorescence microscope um, that I will describe towards the latter half of the lecture. Let's start off by examining the means by which these micro-optical needles are able to provide micron-scale views of cells deep in living tissue. And our early work in this regard was done by Jurgen Jung in the lab. Together, we developed two different contrast modalities for fluorescence microendoscopy deep in living tissue. These two modalities are the epifluorescence version of microendoscopy, and the second one is the laser scanning two-photon variety of microendoscopy, and they have complementary sets of strengths and limitations. The epifluorescence form uh, functions very similarly to the epifluorescence microscopes that many of you may already be familiar with, except that we have this long, skinny probe for delivering illumination deep into the brain and for uh, receiving images of the cells. This epifluorescence uh, version of microendoscopy uses a standard dichroican filter set, standard sources of illumination, such as a mercury arc lamp. And its virtues are, first of all, its simplicity and the fact that we can acquire full frame images at relatively fast frame rates. So for example, my laboratory regularly uses this modality at frame rates of approximately 100 hertz, sometimes extending to over a kilohertz. However, a disadvantage of epifluorescence microendoscopy is that, like conventional epifluorescence microscopy, this modality is not terribly robust to light scattering and does not provide true three-dimensional image stacks. Due to these disadvantages of the one-photon version of microendoscopy, we also developed a complementary form, the laser scanning two-photon version of microendoscopy, which shares many of the advantages of the conventional two-photon microscope. We also make use of the same kind of illumination source that you would use in two-photon microscopy, typically an ultra-short pulse titanium sapphire laser. The laser beam from this source is brought to a focus at the top face of the micro-optical probe and then scanned here in this plane, typically in a raster pattern. The micro-optical needle then projects and demagnifies the focal spot and scanning pattern deep into tissue. 
Two photon excited fluorescence is generated locally at the focal spot within the tissue, and a portion of this fluorescence then passes back to the probe and can be detected by the photodetector, such as a photomultiplier tube, after the fluorescence pathway is separated from the main optical axis. The main virtues of this approach are that, like two photon microscopy, we can achieve true three dimensional optical sectioning. We also attain superior penetration depth into the tissue as compared to the one photon modality. With this version, we essentially have a two pronged means of going deep into the tissue. First, we can insert the micro optical probe into the tissue location of interest, park it at a given location, and then additionally, we can acquire image stacks extending about 650 microns in depth as measured from the face of the probe. And this uh, depth of imaging is comparable to that uh, attained by the conventional two photon microscope, but here measured from the face of the optical probe that has been inserted deep into tissue. Like other nonlinear optical imaging modalities, two photon microendoscopy achieves focal excitation of, uh, of signal and thus it is more robust to a light scattering as are the other uh, nonlinear optical imaging modalities as compared to conventional fluorescence imaging such as uh, epifluorescence or wide field imaging. So in a nutshell we have two complementary modalities, a relatively simple but very fast modality and a slower modality that provides uh, three-dimensional image stacks. Both of these modalities make use of micro-optical needles or micro-optical probes that are composed of gradient refractive index or GRIN microlenses. Unlike conventional lenses, such as those in my eyeglasses, that use curved refractive surfaces to guide light, GRIN lenses use a different optical principle. These lenses have an internal variation within the material itself of the index of refraction, and this internal variation can be carefully sculpted to guide light in a desired fashion. The optical needles would typically combine uh, multiple green lenses of different types. Uh, typical combinations would be doublets or triplets combining uh, two or three green lenses respectively. There are also some typical sizes for these micro optical needles. 1,000, 500, and 350 microns in diameter. In these photographs, the micro optical objectives are all oriented to the left. The darker coated but longer elements are the relay lenses which as I mentioned earlier, the main purpose of these is to uh, provide us the ability to reach deep into tissue. And in some cases, we've added a third lens at the backside for purposes of numerical, numerical aperture matching to conventional optics that may deliver uh, light to the optical needle. All of these have a resolution in the lateral dimension of approximately one micron. The axial resolution is somewhat poor, about nine to uh, 10 microns. And a little bit later on in the lecture, I will mention uh, some steps that we've taken most recently to correct some of the optical aberrations and to bring some of these probes to the diffraction uh, limit. One interesting facet of these micro-optical needles is that they are relatively economical. For example, our lab has hundreds of these with different optical designs. And this is a far greater number than the typical number of high performance water immersion microscope objective lenses that a biology lab might usually have. Uh, this is of course aided by the uh, economy here. And I tend to think that in the long run, uh, this economy uh, of scale may help this approach uh, proliferate. I'm now gonna share with you a number of examples in which we've been able to use these micro optical probes to inspect details at the micron scale uh, deep within tissue of living subjects. And in this first example, we've been able to look at sarcomeres, which are the basic contractile units of skeletal muscle uh, deep within the um, tissues of live animals and uh, wake behaving humans. This project was a collaboration between my own lab and that of uh, Scott Delp, who is a bioengineer at Stanford, and the work was spearheaded by students Michael Llewellyn and Robert Bretto. And we were very interested in being able to inspect uh, muscle sarcomeres in live humans towards understanding biomechanical issues and issues of motor control, both in healthy subjects and in subjects that may be suffering from various forms of neuromuscular disease. To do this, we took advantage of an intrinsic optical effect that arises within muscle tissue due to the highly ordered but asymmetric structure of the muscle fibers. 
When one illuminates the muscle tissue with an ultra-short pulsed laser beam, such as the Thai sapphire laser beam that you would use in conventional two-photon microscopy, there's a coherent frequency doubling effect. Namely, the infrared light is subject to second harmonic generation, and the signal that one obtains from this is a blue light um, at twice the frequency of the infrared illumination that is used. Thus, we have no need to use any dye or contrast agent when inspecting the sarcomeres of the living muscle fibers. And we can do this through our small micro-optical needles, such as in uh, this image. It shows you we can insert one of the micro-optical needles, for example, through a hypodermic, into uh, the muscle of a live uh, human subject. This slide shows you some of the initial images we obtained using second harmonic generation microendoscopy. These are from the hind limb of a live mouse. Again, there's no dye or contrast agent, but nonetheless, you can see very nicely the muscle fibers and the striations that give strided muscle uh, its name. Now, we were able to correlate the macromolecular structure of the muscle fibers with regard to the spacing between the uh, sarcomeres with the biomechanical posture of the body. And here you can see a series of images taken at different angles of the mouse's ankle joint. And as the angle of this joint changes, you can see the corresponding changes in the extensions or the lengths between the adjacent sets of sarcomeres. When we look at the mean extension length of the sarcomeres as a function of the joint angle, we see that the microscopic measurements, as indicated by these data points, fit very closely the red line, which indicates what you would expect from a basic biomechanical analysis, making use of parameters such as the joints, moment arm, and so forth. Now, by switching the laser beam into a line scanning mode, such that it scans back and forth at rates up to about a kilohertz across the rows of sarcomeres, we can monitor the sarcomere dynamics in real time. So this is a space-time plot in which time is unfolding to the right, space is in this dimension, and at this point in time, we have electrically stimulated uh, the mouse's leg, and you can see the corresponding contraction that results. This is a very reliable process, and the different traces here indicate different trials of the experiment. And the speeds so obtained match, that cl uh, match closely that reported in prior in vitro experiments with excised uh, muscle fibers. Now, we can obtain similar views of sarcomere dynamics in live human subjects. Here at the top of this slide, we see a space-time plot again, with time unfolding to the right. This data was taken in the extensor digitorum in the human wrist. And we can ask the subjects to flex or extend the fingers. And in these different postures, we see that the average sarcomere spacing fluctuates around different mean uh, positions at these different postures. Moreover, there was some difference between the human subjects in the uh, mean spacings of the sarcomeres in these different positions. And we need to do more work to determine whether that variability reflects a true biological variability or more mundane factors, such as slight differences in how the subjects were holding uh, uh, the arm and so forth. Now, our second example of microendoscopy comes in the context of the live mouse brain. This work was fairly recently published in uh, Nature Medicine. And we've been able to combine the use of the micro-optical needles with the chronic mouse preparation that I had mentioned for time-lapse or longitudinal imaging studies of cells uh, deep in the brain. And here in this panel of images, we see some hippocampal pyramidal neurons in area CA1 that we were able to follow over periods of about uh, two months, returning again and again, not only to the same sites in the, deep in the brain, but also to the same neurons and, in fact, the same uh, neuronal dendrites. And so this allows us to follow what happens to these cells over a substantial period in the life course of the animal. And we were able to do this in healthy mice and in mouse models of brain disease. This work was spearheaded by Tony Ko, Jurgen Young, and Robert Bredo in the lab. And we had many motivations 
for developing an intervital preparation for observing cells uh, in deep brain tissues over weeks and months. We were interested in the possibility of watching cells evolve during uh, brain development or brain aging uh, over the course of learning or during other life ex experiences and as I said in mouse models of brain disease and perhaps in response to new putative treatments. So many motivations for developing this time-lapse preparation. This slide shows you some example data that was acquired on day 22 of one of our imaging experiments after implantation of an optical guide tube deep into the brain. This represents a 2D projection of a 3D stack that was attained in the hippocampal area CA1. Again, we've used an intravascular injection to label the blood plasma. And you can see in detail the structure of the microvasculature here in this two-photon image taken through one of our micro-optical needles. Now, we can also follow individual capillaries as illustrated here in the striatum, a set of data taken by Yaniv Ziv in the lab. And here over a period of about a month, you can see we can return to individual capillaries again and again in this animal. And indeed, you can see that these capillaries are stable down to the micron scale. We use this capability for inspecting the microvasculature to perform a study of brain tumor or glioma angiogenesis in a collaboration with my colleague Larry Recht, who is a neuro-oncologist at Stanford. Glioma is an affliction that tends to arise preferentially in humans in deep brain tissues. However, prior intravital microscopy studies of glioma in animal models had used so-called non-orthotopic assays in which the glioma cells might be implanted in more superficial brain matter. And with our new approaches for looking deep in the brain, we had an opportunity to inspect glioma angiogenesis in a uh, more normal deep location where primary gliomas uh, tend to arise. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of these data sets, but you can see here in, in one of the brain hemispheres that was inoculated with glioma cells how quickly the vasculature becomes abnormal here on day 20, even compared to uh, the opposing hemisphere uh, in which the vasculature uh, looks quite healthy. And we think that this is an important example regarding how our micro-optical needles may be used to study animal models of many severe brain diseases. Now, what about using time-lapse microendoscopy to inspect neuronal attributes? Robert Bretto in the lab used a transgenic mouse line that expressed a fluorescent protein under the control of the Thi1 promoter. And in the mice that he used, a subset of the hippocampal pyramidal neurons uh, were so labeled. Here you see a series of two photon image stacks acquired over a period of about five weeks. And these stacks extend about 550 microns in depth, here flattened to 2D in a projection. And Robert was particularly interested in following these hippocampal pyramidal neurons because the hippocampus is an important brain area for the formation of episodic memories. And in this particular subregion of hippocampus, area C1, there's a disynaptic input from the dentate gyrus where there's ongoing neurogenesis or birth of new neurons throughout adult life. And so he posed the question of whether these dendrites might undergo continual remodeling even in the adult brain. So we took an initial look at this question and follow the dendritic trees using microendoscopy of these neurons in the adult brain. And contrary to our hypothesis that we might see ongoing remodeling, these dendrites were, in fact, incredibly stable. Here you can see that there's scarcely any change in these neuronal dendrites over a period of about two months. The estimated mean stability lifetime of these dendrites was over 8,000 days, which, in fact, is longer than the lifetime of the mouse itself. We did see a few instances of change. And there are only a, about 16 instances in the very large data set of thousands of dendrite inspections that Robert performed. This particular arrowhead points to a slight extension as one of these examples. And down here, we see a very slight retraction. That was about it uh, regarding the extent of the change in the dendrites that we saw using in this time lapse uh, experiment at the dendrite level. Of course, one does see changes at the, uh, the synapse level if you follow dendritic spines. However, in our initial versions of the microendoscopes, we did not have the optical resolution necessary to see the postsynaptic elements, the dendritic spines. Thus, in a collaboration with Bernhard Messerschmitt, 
we were able to correct for some of these optical aberrations by adding an additional optical element at the front face of the micro-optical probe. And here at the bottom, you see a comparison of the resulting point spread functions between this corrected micro-optical probe and a commercially available water immersion microscope objective lens from Olympus. This is the lateral point spread function, and this is the axial point spread function. We're now able to attain the diffraction uh, limit with these probes. And looking through these optical probes, now we can see the dendritic spines. And at this finer level of observation, indeed, we see uh, changes in the dendritic structure. So I hope to have convinced you at this point that we have new means for inspecting cellular attributes deep within tissue. I now want to address the second challenge that I posed at the outset of how do we image cells in awake behaving animal subjects such as our mice. And we have pursued two different approaches to this. The first approach uh, makes use of alert mice that have been habituated to periods of head restraint under a conventional upright two photon fluorescence microscope. And this approach offers the benefits of the higher resolution that the conventional microscope can provide. However, it also restricts the animal behavior. This restriction in the animal's uh, range of responses can be advantageous for many uh, neuroscience experiments. But for other experiments in which you might want to have the animal behave freely, this is a major disadvantage. This first approach for applying light microscopy to awake behaving animals was developed in our lab by Oxel Nimrion, who's now at the Salk Institute. And he was very interested in studying cerebellar dynamics. Related approaches were also developed earlier by David Tank's lab at Princeton University. This slide shows you what was involved in Oxel's setup. The animal is head restrained under the conventional microscope objective, but is allowed to move freely on this exercise ball, and it can walk or run at liberty while we perform two-photon microscopy to observe the cellular uh, dynamics that are ongoing during animal behavior. I'm going to show you an example video of what Oxel was able to record. He's looking here at Bergman glia, the sole type of astrocyte in the molecular layer of the cerebellar cortex. And on the left, we can see the calcium imaging data that he was able to record in the Bergman glia. The middle panel shows a red marker that selectively labels astrocytes. And the right panel shows the overlay of the two. Blue indicates calcium activation. The red bar indicates the speed of the mouse on the exercise ball. And what I want you to notice is that when the mouse begins to run, the entire optical field turns blue, indicating widespread activation of the gap junction coupled Bergman glial networks in the cerebellar cortex. So by using the microscope in this awake behaving animal, we were able to visualize network activation in the glia um, in a behaviorally triggered fashion. Now our second approach to inspecting cellular dynamics in awake behaving mice makes use of the small optical elements that I've been discussing. We were able to combine these small lenses with other small elements um, for making tiny microscopes that are light enough to be born on the head of an adult mouse as it freely behaves. The virtues of this approach are that, at least in our most recent version of the miniaturized microscope, we can actually watch more neurons due to the broader field of view as compared to the conventional two-photon microscope. The fact that the animal is able to wear the microscope on its head as it freely behaves means this approach is, is essentially compatible with nearly all the established rodent behavioral assays. We're performing one photon imaging in our most recent version of this, which allows us to attain frame rates of, a, of about 100 hertz. We can perform long experiments. The lack of head restraint implies that the individual sessions can sometimes be longer. And this miniature microscope is compatible with the time lapse or chronic preparation that I described uh, for longitudinal imaging experiments. Early work in our development of miniaturized microscopes for freely behaving mice was done by Benjamin Flussberg and Eric Cocker in the lab. And in their early work, we were using fiber optics to deliver light from uh, remote light sources and other fibers to deliver the fluorescence photons to remotely situated uh, detectors. An example of such a design is illustrated here. This is a small microscope that was made 
in collaboration with my colleague Olaf Solgard at Stanford. The work was spearheaded by Weeble Peel Watsonameda and Eric Cocker. And this is a two photon microscope in which we've used a microelectromechanical systems laser scanning mirror fabricated in silicon. Ultra short pulses are brought to the specimen through this pathway indicated by the red arrows. Two photon excited fluorescence is collected through this pathway indicated by the green arrows. This slide uh, shows an electron micrograph of the laser scanning mirror that Weeble made in the Stanford microfabrication facilities. And with this microscope, we were able to visualize microvasculature and uh, capillary flow speeds in vessels of the neocortex. More recently, we realized that the advances in semiconductor cameras, such as those used in cell phones, provide an opportunity to create an entirely integrated high-performance light microscope. And by integrated, what we mean is that all of the optical parts from light source to camera are contained within a tiny miniaturized package. This project was recently published and is a collaboration between my lab and that of Abbas Al-Gamal. And I should also mention that I'm involved with a, uh, a company that has emerged to uh, commercialize this technology. Here you can see one of the resulting microscopes on the tip of my finger. This work was spearheaded by Kanal Ghosh, Lori Burns, and Eric Cocker in the lab. And this was a joint project between the two groups. This slide shows you a cutaway view of what's inside this tiny light microscope. You can see here the scale bar of five millimeters. There's a CMOS semiconductor camera for image acquisition. Illumination is provided by this tiny LED. And there's a small dichroican filter set for performing fluorescence imaging. This shows you a photograph of the device. And here you can see the different elements. Again, the camera, the filter set, and the illumination source. And here in this slide, I'm showing you some example videos. This is neocortical microcirculation as acquired by this mini microscope. If you look carefully, I think you can see the individual erythrocytes passing through some of these capillaries. And I don't think you would have guessed that these videos were taken by a small microscope if I hadn't told you. Now we can place our microscope on an awake behaving mouse. The data is streaming digitally from the head of the mouse into our computer by way of the USB port. You can see that the animal carries the microscope while it behaves quite naturally. In this panel, we're able to see the simultaneously acquired video of microcirculation in the cerebellar cortex, a motor area. And one aspect of this that we were very pleased about was the relative lack of motion artifact in the brain video. We didn't know whether, we didn't know a priori whether there would be a lot of motion artifact as the animal behaves freely. But as you can see, indeed, the images of the brain are quite stable. Here we can see another example where the animal is running freely on the exercise wheel while we are acquiring images from the cerebellar cortex. We can see a passage of red blood cells through the capillaries at frame rates up to 100 hertz. From such data, one can extract the speeds at which the red blood cells pass through the individual capillaries. And we can track these flow speeds across different behavioral states. And we can see how these speeds vary depending on whether the animal was sitting still, walking, or running. And interestingly, these data revealed not only changes in the mean flow speed and vessel diameter, but also an unexpected level of heterogeneity across the optical field in the cerebellar cortex. Only about 30% of the vessels were regulated in this fashion as the animal transitioned from a resting state to a walking state to running on its wheel. Now I'm also going to show you neuronal dynamics. And this was work spearheaded in the laboratory by postdoc Dr. Yaniv Zeev and Lori Burns. And they were Im able to image neuronal dynamics in the CA1 area of the hippocampus of freely behaving mice. They combined the use of this integrated microscope with a micro-optical needle for looking deep in the brain. And they expressed the the fluorescent calcium indicator, GCAM3, using a viral vector approach in the hippocampal pyramidal neurons. I'm going to show you a video of what this looks like. Here, as the animal behaves in this enclosure, we can see hundreds of CA1 pyramidal neurons that are active by way of looking at their calcium dynamics. This video is sped up to twice uh, real time. And from these raw data, we have computational approaches for extracting the locations and identity of the pyramidal neurons that are active. This particular video has about 600 neurons or so. And we can also extract the temporal dynamics of the cells. 
Here you can see traces from about 100 neurons. And the individual traces reveal the sparse dynamics that you saw in the, in the videos. There's long periods of quiescence interrupted by uh, transient calcium dynamics that are very prominent, as you saw in the video of the awake behaving mouse while we were watching its hippocampus. Now, there's been a lot of work historically on these CA1 pyramidal neurons, and they are known to encode aspects of the animal's uh, location within its spatial environment. And indeed, we can see this optically. Here you can see that individual neurons tend to fire preferentially in specific locations of the animal's enclosure. So for example, cell 159 tends to be preferentially active in this corner of the square box. But if you pick up the mouse and put it into the circular arena, cell 159 does not seem to be involved in the representation of space in this environment. Other cells, such as cell 244, seem to be active in the representation of space in both environments. But here, in the circular arena, this cell fires in the lower left, whereas in the square arena, the cell fires in the upper left. So we are able to see remapping of the place fields, as it's known in the neuroscience literature, here using light microscopy in awake behaving mice. So we envision that in the future, one may be able to perform long-term brain imaging of the, of the dynamics of large sets of individ individual neurons in many mice at once, perhaps performing interesting behavioral assays. These mice might be expressing genetically encoded indicators of neural activity. However, we also envision there may be other potential usages of the integrated light microscope. Perhaps there will be high throughput screens or high content assays that are performed with standard format well plates. Um, these might provide interesting alternatives to conventional means now used for uh, assays such as cell counting assays. We might be able to make grids of such microscopes that would mate with our standard format well plates. These might have interesting applications in biotechnology. And as a, just a proof of concept, our paper describes the use of the integrated microscope for looking at uh, samples of uh, tuberculosis bacterium using a fluorescent dye, uh, or amine O, which is capable of labeling uh, these bacilli. So to sum up, I've shown you that these microoptical needles or microendoscopy has interesting capabilities for inspecting cells that may lie deep within the tissues of live human or animal subjects. We use these capabilities for watching sarcomeres in striated muscles of live humans and subjects. We've used microendoscopy in conjunction with chronic animal preparations for, for performing time lapse studies over weeks and months. We've used the small optical lenses as the basis for mass producible or integrated light microscopes that permit high speed brain imaging in awake behaving mice. I showed you we were able to use this approach to track hippocampal place cells. And overall, we envision a diverse set of applications for this integrated uh, light microscope. This is a photograph of my group at Stanford in front of the BioX Clark Center at Stanford. Our work involves the combination of approaches from many different disciplines. And thus, our group has representation from scientists and engineers of different backgrounds. And I want to thank you for your interest today in this subject matter.